Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. And in this video, I'm going to be doing another experiment type of video and I'm going to be answering the question, are stocks that have high levels of debt actually worse investments on average over the long term? And the reason I was curious about this was because of some comments that I got in the last video I made when I was talking about GFL, which is a company in the waste management space where many people seem to be avoiding that company because GFL does have a very high level of debt relative to other companies in the waste management space. And this was resulting in GFL being valued at, to me, what seemed a undeservedly low valuation multiple. And as a result, it's one of the reasons why I actually ended up investing in that company. And this got me thinking a little bit about whether or not companies that do have high levels of debt relative to other companies in their industry are those companies actually worse off over the long term? Or is this maybe a risk that doesn't actually end up affecting the overall returns of companies that much? And the conventional wisdom in investing would say, yes, you know, companies that do have high levels of debt are going to do worse over the long term because higher debt means higher interest expense and higher interest expense ultimately means less cash that can be distributed to common shareholders of that company. So assuming all else equal, the company that has more debt should be a worse investment than the company that has a lower level of debt. But I think you also have to ask another critical question, which is what about valuation? Because if investors are unfairly punishing companies that do have higher levels of debt with a lower valuation multiple, then it's possible that some of those companies could actually end up being better investments over the long term, especially if they're able to effectively reduce that debt, make it more and more manageable each year. And then maybe the multiple that investors are valuing that company at expands because the debt isn't really as big a risk as it once was. So that's what I'm going to be answering uh, in this video. Before I get into that, though, I just wanted to quickly mention that I have finally decided to start a Investing Sucks Discord channel. I had a few people request this, and I think it'd be a good place for viewers of the channel to discuss ideas. And then I can also share with you guys what kind of things I'm working on behind the scenes and then answer questions from you guys as well. So if you do use Discord, feel free to join this. Link will be in the description of this video. Okay, so now I want to discuss how I actually went about creating this back test. So first of all, I want to discuss how did I define companies that were considered to have high levels of debt for their respective industry? So the metric that I used for this was net debt to EBITDA, and I've put the calculation for that on screen here. So net debt, for those who don't know, is basically just total interest-bearing liabilities. So things like operating lines, term loans, any form of long-term or short-term debt that has an interest rate attached to it minus things like cash, cash equivalents, then also short-term investments. Because sometimes companies can have debt, but if the cash that they received from issuing that debt hasn't been actually deployed into the business and used to make any kind of investments in the business, so it's not actually funding the operations, then it isn't really relevant debt, right? So to meet the back test requirements, which I've outlined here, and this list is basically, it's a five-year back test that I did, and these are all companies that met this condition. And the condition is that their net debt to EBITDA ratio has to be at least two times as high as the industry median for whichever industry they belong to. So this is using my website here. Again, this is tickernomics.com. If you watch my channel, you'll know all about this website. But for those who are new, this is a website that I created in one of the uh, features on this website is basically these custom scripts, which is basically customized lists that uh, I put together that are defined based on code. So this is the code that I use to generate this. So if you are interested in seeing this list, then you can go to my website. If you go to public scripts here, you can search for the back test. It's just called high debt companies. And then there's a five-year back test and a 10-year back test. So that's what this list is here. It's companies that met uh, that condition. And then there also is some other exclusions that I have in here. For example, companies must have a market cap of at least $500 million. And I excluded certain industries. So certain industries like financial service companies, um, the net debt uh, metric doesn't really work for them. Companies must also have positive EBITDA because, again, if we're doing net debt to EBITDA, then the company needs to have positive EBITDA for that metric to make sense. So really, we're just looking at actual profitable companies in this space. And also, I exclude industries like biotech because I personally don't invest in biotech companies anyways. So various exclusions like that. I also included like real estate firms, asset management firms, basically any sort of special scenario that didn't really make it uh, comparable to use for this specific metric.
So then what I did after I ran this five-year back test is I also did a 10-year back test. And the reason I did this is because I want to test two different time periods. Because realistically, when you're doing this kind of back test in the investing world and you're looking at how stock prices are influenced by a certain thing, whatever it is you're looking at, if your hypothesis is actually true, then it should be true across multiple different time periods of data and not just true for one time period, right? So it's good to back test different time periods to kind of strengthen what it is you're looking to test. So this is the data here. And we can see there's actually quite a lot of companies that end up meeting that requirement of having their net debt to EBITDA ratio at least two times the median for their industry. Here there's about, I think, 500 companies that meet that requirement, which does make sense, right? Because some companies within a given industry are going to have you know, ratios that are higher than the median and some are gonna have ratios that are much higher than the median, right? So it makes sense that from a population of roughly about 11,000, 12,000 companies that we're pulling from here, that a good, roughly 500, so a pretty good amount overall, are going to end up on this list. So then what I did after I ran those two scripts is I exported the results uh, into Excel, which you can do. There's a button here to do that, to export into Excel. And I kind of summarized the data to just go over what the results actually ended up looking like. So let's go through that now. And we'll start with the five-year back test, right? So for the high debt companies, right? Again, that's that requirement where their net debt to EBITDA or leverage ratio is two times the industry uh, median. For those companies over the five-year period, their average return was 7.39%. And this is an annualized return. So it's 7.39% on average per year each year for five years. And if we look at all companies, it's just over 8%. So clearly it's not a big difference, right? It's about 0.6 here, but clearly companies with higher debt did slightly worse than companies that did not have higher debt. Or if we just take, you know, the whole population of companies, including the high debt ones and the low debt ones, right? So there's really, you know, only a slight difference in performance. And here is the distribution of returns. So this is categorized into, again, the annualized returns of companies that did really poorly, negative 20% annualized, all the way up to the companies that did very well, over 40% annualized. And the most common cohorts that companies fall into are kind of the ones in the middle of that range. So for companies that returned somewhere between 0% and negative 10%, for the high debt cohort, there was that represented 16% of the population, whereas when we're looking at all companies, it was 14%, right? So clearly, you know, two percentage points more of the high debt companies had worse returns, right? Returns that were only slightly negative. Then if we look at the cohort of 0% to 10% annualized returns, it's basically the same, right? 29% for each. But then when we get to the more positive returns, 10% to 20% per year, now, you know, we kind of see the difference, right? The all company uh, cohort was 26%, and then that high debt cohort was 22%, all right? But now the key question comes, what if we adjust for the valuation. Specifically, let's use the valuation metric enterprise value to EBITDA. And again, we'll compare that to the industry median. So what if companies had an enterprise value to EBITDA metric that was below the median for whichever industry that they belong to, and also they had high debt, right? So their net debt to EBITDA was two times the industry median. Now we see something interesting, right? 11% was the average annualized return for those companies, which is much higher than if we just look at all companies, which is 8%, right? And then I was also curious, right? Does that have to do with just the fact that they're cheap, right? And on average, when it comes to investing, if you're paying cheaper prices for companies, you should in theory do get better returns over a long enough time horizon. So what if we you know, took out this high debt requirement and only looked at cheap companies, right? And the cheap companies was actually less, right? Nine and a half percent. So for this five year period, it was interesting to see that, you know, it does seem based on the data here that investors are kind of unfairly punishing companies that have high debt, but companies that are also cheap, right? I mean, that kind of relates to why investors are punishing them, right? They're valued uh, at a cheaper multiple relative to their industry. But these results should also hold up if it is true over the 10 year period, right? So now let's look at the same data. The returns are a bit less. Uh, the average returns overall are a bit less when you look at a 10 year period, just because, you know, when you stretch out the past five years have been very good for the market overall. When you stretch it over a 10 year period, it is slightly worse. And also in this data, I am including companies that got delisted. So when you stretch it out over a 10 year time period, you get more delisted companies, right? And obviously 
if a company was delisted, it probably didn't do so well, right? And that's kind of just the reality of capitalism, right? A lot of companies get delisted and there actually is a surprisingly high amount of companies uh, that get delisted. I think it's a, quite a shocking number once you look at it. But anyways, these are the results. So high debt companies, right, over the time, the 10 year time period, about four and a half percent. Whereas if we just look at all companies, then it's 5.3%. So again, similar to above, you know, the high debt companies did only slightly worse. But then if we look at high debt companies that are cheap, again, the results are better, right? Now we get to 6.43%. But that other kind of qualifying factor where if we only look at cheap companies, this ideally, if what we're trying to study here is actually true, where investors are unfairly punishing companies that have high debt, then companies that are just cheap companies, this return should be lower, but it isn't, it's 7.4%. So it doesn't really hold up, but it's interesting to see how, you know, how much of a factor, you know, basically investing in cheap companies, right, uh, actually ends up being and how you can consistently get better returns investing in the cheaper companies. Now, what I was also curious, and this is the last step, is what about companies that reduce their debt? So the last kind of column I added into uh, the table that I was showing you before was what their current leverage ratio is or net debt to EBITDA. So what if they reduce that? Because again, like if companies kind of reduce their debt, then that perceived risk that they have of being a higher debt company relative to their industry is now gone. Maybe there are multiple expands and they should get better returns as a result of that. But the results were a little inconsistent. It was interesting to see that over the five year back test time period, those companies, so high debt companies, cheap companies that ended up lowering their net debt to EBITDA ratio for so from five years ago, uh, you know, their current ratio is lower than it was five years ago. Now, 7.61% was the average or 17.61% was the average return for those companies. So when I saw that, I was like, my goodness, have I just solved the stock market? But it doesn't really hold up over the 10 year time horizon, right? This actually ends up being 5.39%, basically the exact same as this cohort here, where of just, you know, all companies in general. So if this number ended up being something in like the, you know, double digit range, then I would have gotten very interested in this, I would have studied it further. But I think this is still interesting and useful information overall, because it does kind of show that, you know, necessarily companies that have higher debt aren't always going to be worse investments. And if you're investing in higher debt companies that are also cheap, relative to their industry, then even in that case, most of the time, those companies will end up being better investments on average. So I hope you did find this video useful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate if you'd consider subscribing and I'll see you guys in the next video.